Hello geometry students. In this lesson we are going to be talking about indirect proofs and if you're like me you're probably going to find this lesson just super annoying. It's not that indirect proofs themselves are really all that hard. It's just you're not used to thinking this way and coming up with like the ending part of an indirect proof is really tricky. Now the good news is you're not oftentimes going to be asked to come up with an indirect proof all on your own. That's the really hard thing to do. And you will eventually be expected to do that. But at least at the beginning, you're going to be doing a lot of like putting indirect proof parts in order or uh, picking out what the contradiction is that you're looking for or the assumption that you're going to make that you're going to prove wrong. Okay, you'll see what I mean by all that in a minute. The point is indirect proofs are kind of hard. So pay really close attention to this video and do your best to make sure you understand. Now, first of all, we're going to talk about a type of reasoning that we've been using all year. We've been using direct reasoning. Direct reasoning is reasoning that you start with a true hypothesis and you build a logical argument to show that that hypothesis can be concluded correct. You prove something true by assuming that it's true the entire time. Indirect proof is a contradiction from the very beginning because you need to prove that something is true, but you can't prove it directly. Like for example, if I need to prove that um, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, the only way to prove that is to observe every possible set of two points to see that yes, if I have two points and I have a, a straight line between them, that is indeed the shortest distance between that set of two points and that set of two points and that set and that and that set and that set. How do I prove for every set of two points that a straight line is the shortest distance between them? Well, in comes indirect proofs. Indirect proofs are proofs that you, you take your statement that you are trying to prove and you assume it to be false. You assume that what you're trying to prove is false. And then you prove that if, okay, if what I'm trying to prove is, is not true, it contradicts this theorem or law or definition. And if it contradicts one of the rules or laws or definition, if that is not true, then it must be true. Okay, so you're probably already lost a little bit, and that's fine. We're going to go through some examples. This is one lesson where I encourage you to go through the examples in the book, because those do a great job, too, of explaining, just giving you more, 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 more experience with this. That's what you need. So I'm going to give you some experience. It can't hurt to get more experience with this by going through the examples in the book. Here are the steps to uh, these indirect proofs. First of all, you need to assume the conclusion is false. So you're asked to prove something. Uh, prove that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I'm going to assume that the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. Okay, I'm going to assume the conclusion is false. I'm going to assume the opposite of the conclusion. Then you show that your assumption that the conclusion is false is contradicted by a theorem, postulate, definition, or given information in the problem. Um, and that given information like might also be like a step in your proof. So you, you reason to a certain step in your proof, you carefully show that everything up to that step is, is logical. And then that step proves the um, conclusion, the assumption is contradicted. And the moment you contradict your assumption, you can state that the assumption must be false because of the contradiction. So the conclusion, the original conclusion that you stated that must be false, that conclusion must be true. Okay, and then just a quick note, you should always start these with a diagram. Uh, when I'm looking at student work on these, I won't give a student the time of day if they don't have a diagram drawn to show the problem. I know these are hard and you, likely if a student has questions on they actually do have questions. But you need to start with a diagram in order to even have a hope of, of 
coming up with a conclusion for a lot of these. Okay, let's take a look at some practice problems because this is one where we actually need to see this in action to make sense of it. A and B are ones where we simply need to state the assumption that we would make in order to start an indirect proof. So if first I'm trying to prove that the measure of angle X is equal to the measure of angle Y indirectly, I would state that the measure of angle X is not equal to the measure of angle Y. If I'm trying to make an assumption for an indirect proof to show that um, AB is perpendicular to CB, I would say AB is not perpendicular to CB. Notice I'm not stating the opposite. I'm not stating that AB is parallel to CB. I'm just stating that the thing I'm trying to prove is false. And then what I'm looking for is evidence that if, in fact, that thing is false, um, I th th there's a contradiction against one of the other theorems, postulates, definitions, or givens. Okay, Letter C is a good example of this. An isosceles triangle has at least two congruent sides. To prove this, oh, I'm sorry, this is not a good example. Of this. To, uh, <laughs> I forgot, I thought it was on D already. Let's, let, letter C, I hate. I hate this example. I started reading it, I remember just how much I hate this example. The reason I hate this example is because isosceles triangle is a definition. We've defined isosceles to mean that two sides are congruent. You can't really use an indirect proof to disprove a definition because how do you prove that the definition of something is wrong? The, the, the definition is something we confer on something. We decided that this is what we're going to, to, this word is going to mean. And we're just saying that this word means something different. So I don't like letter C, but I get what, they're, what the author is going for. So to prove this statement indirectly, that an isosceles triangle has at least two congruent sides, we need to assume an isosceles triangle does not have at least two congruent sides. And the question is just what case needs to be explored to find a contradiction? Well, okay, so I can state the case that needs to be explored. Um, I don't know how I go about proving a definition is wrong, though. The case that needs to be explored is an isosceles triangle without at least two congruent sides. And since a triangle only has three sides with three different length sides, that would be the case we would have to explore. Now, again, I don't know how to prove a definition wrong, uh, but that's the case we would be looking into to prove that the definition has to be correct. All right, now, letter D is a good example. Okay, this is the one I was looking forward to. Use an indirect proof to prove that a triangle can have at most one right angle. Well, I'm going to start by saying, um, assume a triangle can have more than one right angle. Um, okay, so that means that the measure of angle A I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna write a. Uh, we'll use this symbol for angle for now, even though it's not exactly. Plus the measure of angle B, plus the measure of angle C, equals 180 degrees. Okay, that's just the triangle angle sum theorem. Now let's say that the measure of angle A is 90. It's a, it's a right angle. And the measure of angle B is 90. It also is a right angle. This triangle has two right angles. So what we're saying then is 90 plus 90 plus the measure of angle C equals 180. But then that means that the measure of angle C must equal 0, which is a contradiction. It contradicts the definition of an angle because by definition angles have to be greater than zero degrees. So because I've contradicted my assumption, the statement must be correct that a triangle can have at most one right angle. That's how you do a proof, uh, an indirect proof. Okay, that's how we do it. Let's take a look at another one of these. An indirect proof to show that angle 4 is congruent to angle 6. Well, let's start with an assumption. 
we're going to assume that angle 4 and angle 6 are not congruent. Okay? And we're just going to assume that M is still parallel to N, so any other relationships here should work. Just, I can't have angle 4 and angle 6 congruent. All right, let's see what happens. I'm going to state that angle 1 and angle 4 are a linear pair. Okay? There's nothing saying that they can't be a linear They are a linear pair by definition of linear pair. And that means that the measure of angle 1 and angle 4 have to equal 180 degrees according to the linear pair theorem. Angles 5 and 6 also form a linear pair. And therefore, by the linear pair theorem, their angles must also equal 180 degrees. I'm also going to note that angles 5 and so, so so far we've said 1 and 4 linear pair 180 degrees 5 and 6 linear pair 180 degrees also going to note that 5 and 1 are corresponding angles um, and I know according to the corresponding angle I believe this one's a postulate I'd have to look back um, angle 5 and angle 1 have to be congruent because they're corresponding angles okay now I'm going to use substitution because I know 5 and 1 are congruent. I can substitute the measure of angle 5 for the measure of angle 1. So we're going to state this. Uh, the measure of angle 5 plus the measure of angle 4 equals 180 degrees. And the measure of angle 5 plus the measure of angle 6 equals 180 degrees. You see what I did? I replaced this measure of angle 1 with the measure of angle 5 because 5 and 1 are congruent to each other um, because they're corresponding. Well, wait a second. If the measure of angle 5 plus the measure of angle 4 equals 180 and the measure of angle 5 plus the measure of angle 6 equals 180, um, anytime I have two angles that are... Uh, supplementary with the same angle those angles have to be congruent to each other so this contradicts our assumption because angles supplementary to the same angle are congruent and these angles even though they're supplementary to the same angle they're not congruent by our assumption therefore because our assumption is contradicted angle four and angle six must be congruent. Do you see how annoying this is? It's cool. I mean, there's some things that have to be proved this way, and it's really neat that this proof works. It's just not the way your brain is used to operating. So what you have to do is get your brain used to operating this way, and the only way to do that is to practice, practice, practice. And then it won't be so annoying anymore. So what you need to do is do the practice problems for this lesson uh, paying attention to especially these problems where we're going to be using indirect proofs to prove things.